When it comes to going out in a blaze of doomed glory, HMS Glowworm is one of the most famous examples. Here is a ship that, in some of the worst weather imaginable, matched herself against a far larger enemy. She fought long and hard, before ultimately slipping beneath the waves. It was a last stand every bit as worthy of remembrance as Samar. Even the Germans, aboard their wounded cruiser, had nothing but respect for the bravery of Glowworm's crew and captain. To the point that... Well, I'll get into that later. For now, as always, we must look at Glowworm's career before that battle, as well as her design though I will only give the basic details on the latter this time around. HMS Glowworm was laid down on August 15th, 1934, and launched on July 22nd, 1935. Her commissioning would follow in January 1936, setting her as a firmly mid-1930s destroyer design. Specifically, in her case, a G-class destroyer. These were fairly average interwar destroyers in almost all respects. Relatively small, relatively lightly armed, and generally not sticking out from contemporary designs. Glowworm, as launched, was no exception to this rule. The destroyer displaced around 1,370 tons at her standard loading, with that rising as high as 1,900 tons on her deep loading. That tonnage was put towards an armament of four single 4.7-inch guns, carried in a typical layout. Two super-firing on the bow, and two super-firing on the stern. As for her anti-aircraft weaponry, this was pretty light, even by interwar standards. Only two quadruple 50 caliber machine gun mounts. These being Vickers 50 caliber guns, incidentally, not the more famous Browning variety. That said, to this point, she isn't any different from her sisters. Where Glowworm is special, in terms of her design, is in her torpedo battery. A standard G-class destroyer, carried two quadruple tubes for a total of eight 21-inch torpedoes. Glowworm carried a pair of experimental quintuple 21-inch tubes. This brought her total count of torpedoes to 10 fish in all. The remainder of her weaponry at this point was rounded out by a single depth charge rail and two depth charge throwers. As for her power plant and speed, Glowworm was fitted with three boilers, providing 34,000 shaft horsepower. This was driven through two shafts, bringing her up to an impressive, although not spectacular, 36 knots. That brings us to an end on her design details, however. Now for the service history, which consisted of the usual peacetime roles, and one major climactic battle. Now, as I said before, Glowworm was commissioned into the Royal Navy at the start of 1936. Upon completion of her sea trials, she was sent off to the Mediterranean fleet where Glowworm would spend most of her career. Though she didn't really get up to all that much in this period. In fact, Glowworm would only perform various escort and patrol duties due to the Spanish Civil War. These included escorting King Edward VIII around the Mediterranean during August and September of 1936. This led directly into neutrality patrols off the Spanish coast that lasted until she returned to Britain for a refit in mid-1937 at which point it was back to the first destroyer flotilla in the Mediterranean, for nothing particularly exciting. In point of fact, barring more escort duty, she would do very little of note from 1937 through to 1939. Glowworm escorted an ocean liner, the Strath Naver, familiar to those who watch ocean liner designs, I imagine, in 1938. Specifically, she escorted the liner during the Munich Crisis and then she did the same thing for Royal Navy warships at around the same time. More importantly, it was during this period, in July 1938, that Glowworm gained her new and final commander, Gerard Broadmead Roop, a man who would, in short order, pick up a couple nicknames. First, Old Ard Over, for a tendency to change course at a moment's notice. Obviously a play on the command, Hard Over. And secondly, Rammer Roop, for reasons that will become apparent as we go along. That said, and with all this in mind, I'd say the first real exciting moment in her career came on the night of May 16th, 1939. A haunting portent of things to come, if you want to look at it this way. Because, in the process of training on night exercises, 
Glowworm collided, bow first, with her sister HMS Grenade. This did a number on her bow, as shown on screen now, but it didn't really put either ship at risk of sinking. It did, however, send Glowworm to Alexandria for temporary repairs, and then on to Malta for more lasting repairs that kept her in dock from late May through late June 1939. This does mean that, upon completion of those repairs, Glowworm only had a couple of months left before World War II began. The start of that war would, in fact, find her in Alexandria's harbor. Not that she would remain there long, as Italy was still neutral, if very heavily leaning in Germany's direction. So instead of sticking around the Mediterranean, Glowworm was sent back to Britain in October 1939. Here she would continue her escort duties, though now it had moved from ocean liners and cruisers to convoys at war. Glowworm would remain on this duty, alongside anti-submarine patrols, until November 12th. At that point, she was moved to Harwich and to North Sea patrol duty. I'm sure that was fun for her crew, who were used to the sunny Mediterranean. In any event, Glowworm spent the early war on these tasks until she had her second collision. This time, on February 22nd of 1940, Glowworm collided with the Swedish freighter, Rex. This was in heavy fog, so one can't really blame either side too much here in an era before common shipboard radar. Regardless, you can now see why her captain picked up Rammer Roop as a nickname. If only the crew knew how fitting that nickname truly was. As for the damage from that collision, it would keep Glowworm in dry dock until late March. She would, at that point, rejoin the first destroyer flotilla of the home fleet. By early April, specifically the 5th, she was assigned to cover HMS Renown in Norwegian waters. On the 7th, Glowworm was detached to search for a torpedo man that had been lost overboard on the night of the 6th. This would be the last time any British ships saw HMS Glowworm. With the already terrible weather getting worse by the minute, Glowworm was reduced to just 10 knots. She was unable to track down Renown or any other friendly ships as her gyro compass broke down. Reduced to steering by magnetic compass between the foul weather and equipment failures, Glowworm struggled along in the general direction of her comrades. As a sign of how bad the weather really was, another man went overboard on April 7th. This poor soul ended up tangled in ropes over the side of the destroyer, likely being drowned, frozen, and pounded against the hull by wave action. Unsurprisingly, by the time he was found and pulled in, the man was badly injured and dying. I suppose at least he was found, which is more than can be said for the previous loss. That said, with sailors being a superstitious lot at the best of times, this, in combination with the previous loss, was seen as a bad omen. In this case, they would be proven right. On the morning of April 8th, Glowworm, still searching for friendly ships, ran into two German destroyers. Now, Rupp and his crew were aware that the Germans were lurking about but it is fairly likely they weren't expecting two destroyers, both of which far larger than Glowworm, to pop out of the gloom. Not helped by one of the pair, apparently, replying to Glowworm's challenges by claiming to be Swedish. This was reported by Glowworm's sole surviving officer, Lieutenant Robert Ramsey. We immediately challenged her, and she replied that she was Swedish. Then she opened fire. This destroyer was the Z-11, burned von Arnhem. It's agreed that she was here, and this ship outmassed and outgunned Glowworm on her own. A second destroyer soon joined the fray, but I've seen differing claims on which destroyer this was. Most commonly, she'll be cited as Z-18, Hans Ludemann. But I've also seen the ship identified as Z-5, Paul Jacoby. I'd generally be inclined to go with Z-18 here, if only by virtue of more sources, citing her as the second ship. Regardless of which destroyers were present, though, it hardly mattered. Individually, either ship was superior to Glowworm in most ways, at least in direct combat, no matter the fact they were stuffed with soldiers for the Norwegian campaign. With the odds two-on-one in such terrible weather, Glowworm was very much outmatched, and yet Roop still charged his destroyer in anyway. Glowworm's guns blazed away, even as her gun director flooded in the heavy seas. 
She was suffering in the waves, but the British ship still managed at least one hit on a German destroyer, both of which turned and fled even as they fired back. Keep in mind here that Roop was no one's fool. He was very well aware that he was outgunned, and the Germans retreating like that was suspicious at absolute best. Ramsey, the man from before, said that the captain thought the Germans were leading Glowworm on to something more powerful. He was right, if so. The destroyers were radioing for aid, and falling back on a much larger, much more powerful, and much more dangerous warship. Glowworm followed along, because Roop had his duty to keep in mind. Glowworm could theoretically disengage with her speed, even in that weather, but that would be a failure of his mission. Roop had to keep in mind the bigger picture. His destroyer, if it found something like a cruiser or a battleship, would have to shadow that ship and make reports on the enemy position so that something like Renown could come in and engage the Germans. With that in mind, Glowworm followed, and she would run into her target soon enough. By 10 a.m. that morning, a much larger form came out of the fog. This was the heavy cruiser Admiral Hipper, an ostensibly 10,000-ton ship that outmassed Glowworm by a substantial margin and a ship that actually displaced more like 16 to 18,000 tons. At first, the German cruiser couldn't make out which destroyer was which. This is telling because Glowworm was, again, quite a bit smaller than her German counterparts. It goes to show just how bad the weather conditions really were. That said, within 8 minutes, Hipper opened fire. At around 9,000 yards, the cruiser's 8-inch rifles began to blast away at Glowworm. By the fourth salvo, showing remarkable accuracy considering the situation, hits began to land on the destroyer. Understandably, Glowworm began to make smoke, though this would prove to be less useful than hoped. Admiral Hipper was, after all, carrying radar. Not the best for gunnery, but certainly enough to keep an eye on the destroyer, even with her smokescreen making visual targeting difficult. As a result, when Glowworm exited her smokescreen, she was now even closer to Hipper. Close enough that the German cruiser could bring both her main guns and her secondary battery into the action. Between the 8-inch and 4.1-inch guns, Hipper's fire began to show on Glowworm. Her surgeon's party was wiped out. Her radio room bridge and forwardmost 4.7-inch gun were all hit, with the gun destroyed. Additional hits landed on the captain's cabin, the engine room, and the mast. That last one caused a short circuit that had her siren blazing away for the rest of the battle. Imagine for a moment here, two ships blasting away at each other in smoke, fire, fog, and crashing waves. The clash and din of battle deafening you as you run around trying to avoid being killed. And suddenly, on top of all of that, you have a siren constantly blaring like a banshee in the background. I can imagine that unnerved men aboard the destroyer and the cruiser. Unnerving or not, though, it didn't slow the battle or stop Glowworm from fighting back. Throughout all the hits to the ship, including the bridge, Roop escaped uninjured. I've seen at least one reference to Shrapnel killing his dog right between his legs, but the British captain wasn't injured at all. This allowed him to order Glowworm to fire one set of torpedoes, at only 870 yards away from the cruiser. These missed, though the distraction helped Glowworm duck and smoke again, before launching her second set of torpedoes. Unfortunately, while some of the 10 torpedoes came very close to hitting Hipper, none would actually connect. The German captain kept the cruiser pointed, bow on, at Glowworm for exactly this reason. With the torpedo attack a failure, and his ship burning and slowly settling in the water, Roop was out of options. His remaining three guns continued to blast away, but they weren't going to sink Hipper. And while there is some argument on how intentional the following actions were, I prefer to believe the more common survivor testimonies in this case. Which state that, as Hipper followed Glowworm through the smokescreen, Roop turned to his helmsman. The two ships were now practically right on top of each other, with the cruiser largely undamaged and the destroyer crippled far too late to escape, and with no easy way to fight back effectively. Except, well, every ship always has at least one torpedo. <laughs>
Lieutenant Commander Roop, speaking to his helmsman, simply said, ram her. Or stand by to ram, depending. Glowworm turned hard to starboard and barreled down on Hipper. For the sake of fairness, there are some conflicting accounts that say the rudder was jammed to starboard at this point. That the turn was a coincidence. A convenient one for damaging the cruiser, but a coincidence nonetheless. No matter what you choose to believe, Glowworm would slam into Hipper. The German cruiser was too close and too slow to react in the rough seas, rendering her unable to dodge. Glowworm, siren blazing like a vengeful spirit, bore down on Hipper. With the result that the destroyer's battered bow sliced into the cruiser's side. Glowworm hit Hipper just behind her anchor. This broke off Glowworm's bow, leaving the destroyer wildly bouncing in the waves. She would scrape down Hipper's starboard side, gouging more holes into the cruiser. I've seen it reported as around 130 feet of Hipper's plating being torn away, along with damaging her forward starboard torpedo tubes. This was severe damage, including several hundred tons of flooding. It was not, however, crippling damage. Glowworm, missing her bow and blazing from multiple fires, drifted away. And yet she continued to fight back. The surviving 4.7-inch rifles fired back in defiance of the ship's sinking. It was a futile gesture. It was an act of defiance that showed the bravery of the British crew. Roop, however, knew that his ship was done. With no other choice at this point, he ordered the crew to abandon ship. With fires raging and the ship rapidly settling, the crew of Glowworm began to gather anything that would float and prepare themselves to abandon ship. It is at this point that some reports say her boilers, still hot, detonated as the flooding reached them. In any case, so ended the story of HMS Glowworm, but not the story of her crew. With a sudden silence descending, now that the siren was gone, the German cruiser sailed alone. It was at this point that one of the most honorable actions at sea, certainly during the Second World War, took place. The captain of the Admiral Hipper, Helmuth Haya, turned his ship downwind and began to pluck survivors from the water. He ordered his crew to throw lines over the side and help the British survivors aboard. Soldiers and sailors alike set to this task, laboriously pulling weak and wounded men up the lines. This in spite of the fact they had just been fighting. In spite of the fact that Glowworm had rammed Hipper, putting a massive hole in her side that was still taking on water. None of that mattered in the moment as simple humanity took over. Men helped their fellow sailors out of the water as best they could. It didn't matter that they were enemies or that they had just been doing their best to kill each other. Heia and his crew put their ship as close to the survivors as they could and pulled as many men out of the icy Norwegian waters as they could. Unfortunately for all these efforts, it wasn't enough. Only 30 or so men would ultimately survive. I've seen reference to 40 men pulled out of the water, with at least 6 later dying, leaving 34 survivors at most. I've also seen the number 31 floating around for survivors. These men were treated well by their German counterparts. They were given warm clothes and had their wounds treated, with the oil washed off them. Even while German injured were treated alongside them. In the end, though, only a small fraction of the destroyer's crew survived. Roop was not among them. He remained in the water as his crew was helped aboard the German cruiser, personally pushing the other men forward and helping them onto the ropes. He went above and beyond to ensure as much of his crew found safety as possible, with the direct result that when he finally began to climb a rope himself, his body gave out. Pushed past its limits, exhausted and frozen from the icy waters, his grip slipped. Lieutenant Commander Roop fell back into the water, vanishing from sight in the dark waves. His story continued, however. Continuing to show an uncommon honor and respect for his enemy, Captain Haya would put together a message. Sending this on through the Red Cross, he personally recommended Roop for the Victoria Cross. An almost unprecedented act of a man recommending his enemy for the highest honor possible in the enemy country. In the end, on the strength of this message, Roop would receive the Victoria Cross, with the award recognized in July of 1945. And now, at the end of this video, we come to the end of the story of HMS Glowworm. A story of heroism and uncommon respect between enemies.
a story that should never be forgotten, even as the survivors pass from living memory. Thank you for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoy the content, and I'll see you in the next one.